For almost 30 years, the Atomic Energy Commission wielded almost unchallenged authority over the development and regulation of nuclear energy. But by the early 1970s, it faced significant criticism that it promoted nuclear power more than it protected the public from its hazards. As a result, on October 11, 1974, President Gerald Ford signed the Energy Reorganization Act, dissolving the AEC into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and ERDA, the Energy Research and Development Administration, which was later merged into the Department of Energy. I'm Tom Wellock, the historian at the NRC. In this video, we'll explore the congressional battle over the Energy Reorganization Act. AEC skeptics and supporters agreed the agency had outlived its usefulness. Their key dispute was, what should replace it? Opponents of the AEC wanted to completely break up the agency and scatter its programs among agencies with no allegiance to nuclear power. Supporters wanted to speed the adoption of nuclear power by creating agencies built from the AEC's foundations. In creating ERDA and the NRC, pro-nuclear forces triumphed yet it proved a hollow victory that did not secure the nuclear future they imagined. The first major threat to the AEC came in 1971, when President Richard Nixon proposed a cabinet reorganization that would dismantle the AEC. Its civilian nuclear research functions would go to a Department of Natural Resources. The Department of Defense would take AEC weapons programs, and what became the NRC would have been absorbed by the Environmental Protection Agency or the Federal Power Commission. In Nixon's plan, there would be no Energy Development Agency and no independent Nuclear Safety Commission like the NRC. Blocking Nixon's path stood Congressman Chet Holifield. Mr. Atomic Energy, as he was known, was opposed to any move to destroy the AEC. Chairing the House Committee overseeing Nixon's cabinet reorganization, Holifield had considerable leverage. The White House, however, knew Holifield wanted to solve a looming energy crisis by building a liquid metal fast breeder reactor capable of producing more fuel than it consumed. White House staff recommended holding breeder funding hostage unless Holifield agreed to break up the AEC. Holifield turned to the powers of persuasion. In early 1971, Nixon invited him for a ride on Air Force One. The congressman told the president the breeder could give him something to talk about besides the Vietnam War, give the nation energy to last a thousand years, and give Nixon a political legacy rivaling President Kennedy's space program. Nixon was sold and released breeder funding. As it turned out, Nixon's reorganization plan threatened so many interest groups, it never came to a vote. Holifield had won lavish breeder funding, Nixon's Natural Resources Department was dead, and the AEC was safe, or so it seemed. Nixon explored other ways to gain control of the AEC, taking advantage of the agency's safety controversies and its slow pace of new reactor licensing the president replaced outgoing commissioners with loyalists who promised to reform the agency and ready it for the breakup Nixon still favored. Alarmed by Nixon's maneuvers, Holifield offered to split the AEC into a general energy research agency with ample breeder funding, but with some non-nuclear research too, and establish an independent regulatory commission that could speed reactor licensing while assuring the public it could maintain safety standards. For Holifield, creating ERDA and the NRC solved the same problem, how to accelerate the adoption of nuclear power while satisfying critics. In 1973, the congressman won an unexpected ally in Dixie Lee Ray, the AEC's first female chairman. A professor of zoology, the industry press dismissed her as, quote, a spinster who would be a mere caretaker until the AEC was broken up. Instead, Ray became a bruising political infighter and a forceful advocate for Holifield's legislation. Ray's unconventional lifestyle charmed the press. 
Living in a 28-foot motorhome, she brought her two dogs to the office, sporting her trademark white knee socks and a disarming wit. Described as Washington, D.C.'s most powerful woman, a trade publication admitted the industry had laughed at her, but quote, they're not laughing anymore. By mid-1973, Nixon, plagued by Watergate scandal, ceded the legislative initiative to Hollifield and Ray, who pressed forward with creating IRTA in the NRC. Hollifield's legislation in the House ensured breeder development dominated IRTA's research budget, but he granted environmental and fossil fuel interests modest commitments to diverse energy research. He rejected amendments offered by nuclear critics to limit the NRC's independence and impede licensing hearings. In December 1973, Hollifield's bill won overwhelming House approval. The Senate was more friendly to the AEC's critics. Some lawmakers there still favored putting IRTA in a large natural resources department. But the 1974 energy crisis made creating an energy agency like IRTA a priority. Chairman Ray said a natural resources agency bill would pass, quote, over my dead body. And in the spring of 1974, Senator Abraham Ribicoff announced the natural resources bill would not advance. Nuclear power opponents had more success attaching amendments to the NRC's legislation, empowering them to influence commission membership and slow power plant licensing hearings. In conference negotiations, however, Hollifield stripped out virtually all of these contentious Senate amendments. Admitting defeat, Senator Ribicoff explained that action on the energy crisis was, quote, so important that we don't have the temerity, frankly, to delay this thing any longer. IRTA and the NRC began operations on January 19, 1975, amid euphoria over the perceived pro-nuclear victory. Expecting little change, an industry observer wrote, the AEC is dead. Long live the AEC. For the NRC, nuclear power executives were reportedly, quote, positively bubbling over with enthusiasm in anticipation of streamlined reactor licensing. Nuclear power's brighter day was not to be. Weighed down by technical and economic problems, Congress eliminated breeder funding in 1983. The 1979 Three Mile Island accident compelled a tightening of NRC regulations, and poor economic conditions led to a collapse in nuclear plant orders. The Energy Reorganization Act was a turning point, but not the one its authors envisioned. It committed the nation to diverse energy research and development, and in the NRC, independent regulation of nuclear safety through open and efficient processes. That is a legacy for which supporters and skeptics of nuclear power can take credit. <laughs>